My name is Ed Eshelman, and I am a business manager with Armanino. I wanted to take just a little bit of your time today to chat with you about some of the trends that we are seeing in the music industry in 2024. Obviously, we're not going to cover everything going on in the industry, but I did want to speak with you about some of the bigger picture items that we're seeing. And obviously, with the dynamic nature of our industry, you know, items are always changing, innovations, technological advancements, and just other creative splashes, uh, you know, shape our musical landscape. And so I just thought it would be a great time to catch everybody up on a couple of the main things that we're seeing out there. So uh, what I like to do first is I'll give you just kind of a broad overview of what we're going to discuss, and then I'll go ahead and uh, part into each topic. So with that, let's get going. All right, so the four topics we're going to be touching on today are AI slash generative AI, uh, concept of the superfan, what the industry is doing to target superfans. Then we're going to discuss Spotify and its revised royalty payout structure. And finally, we're going to wrap up with uh, live touring and discuss a little bit about not only, uh, I said 2024 trends, we're also going to look at 2023 and what a great year it was in live touring. I think it's important to uh, speak a little bit about that. And then we'll discuss what, again, what we're seeing for 2024. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in and we'll get into the AI slash generative AI discussion. So first of all, I think it's important, you know, sometimes AI and generative AI will conjure images, you know, Terminator or Skynet and, you know, scary thoughts. And while it is a new technology with any new technology, we need to monitor it and make sure we understand it. And are protecting our clients and our artists. So I think it's important to know that this is just a new advancement in technology in the music industry. I mean, the music industry is constantly seeing technological uh, innovations, starting with records to eight tracks, cassettes, CDs, you know, streaming and auto-tune. You know, there's always, there are always technological advancements in our industry. And so AI and generative AI are just the next evolution. And also I think it's important to notice, you know, with AI, we are we've already seen that in our industry i think everybody can recognize you know streaming platforms you know, have used ai to develop algorithms to suggest to people songs you know based on their listening habits i think we all have with that and again personally it's been helpful for me i know you know most people seem to like that feature and so it's just important to know that you know we already are seeing ai in the music space so, you know, that's AI, but then when we discuss uh, generative AI, it's, you know, it's slightly different. While AI focuses on detecting patterns, generative AI is really more of a subset, a subset that focuses on producing new content. So what do I mean by new content? Well, first of all, voice usage or, you know, vocal defects. You know, there's some bad examples of that, right? I think, again, probably a lot of people have, you know, heard of exploiting some artists' voices without compensation. You know, there's a Bad Bunny, Justin Bieber, Daddy Yankee song. There's a generated Z song, Frank Sinatra voice over Lil John. You know, lyrics. There's there's several. There's, you know, been a lot of these vocal deep fakes out there, and you know, they are examples of, you know, quite frankly, how this technology, when used incorrectly, can exploit our artists and and keep them from being compensated. Either well, either first of all, them giving their permission. Second of all, them being appropriately compensated for their voice. You know, another example of generative AI is users creating songs simply by typing in prompts. So again, you know, maybe you want a sad ballad about a breakup and you type in that and a song is created with both, you know, with the voice sounding something like one of the major artists in that genre. And then a personal anecdote I've seen in even youth sports. So I've seen baseball players coming up to bat and one of the parents had reported uh, their name coming up to bat and all of a sudden they've used the generative AI and they have a professional announcer's voice, you know, recording it. So, or excuse me, saying. So again, there, there are many uses of this. And again, we need to be careful. We need to protect our artists and our clients, you know, having a good team in place to monitor this, you know, labels of issue takedowns, you know, there are things to monitor and to watch. But I think the important part is to you know, inform our artists that it's not all bad, that, you know, there are many good examples and uses of generative AI in the industry. You know, oftentimes artists may have writer's block or just trouble getting started and they may be brainstorming or whiteboarding and, you know, generative AI, they can see the AI with initial set of thoughts and get some, you know, direction. Maybe they want to take, you know, their own styles to add to that. Uh, you know, producers can use AI to help correct vocal pitch. 
engineers can mix and master recordings much more quickly and effectively. And there's even the example the Beatles recently used used it to isolate John Lennon's voice from I think it was a 1978 demo uh, to create a new pristinely produced song. So again, there are positives that go along with generative AI. We just need to be careful and monitor. So again, you know, what are some other dangers? I think there is one other important thing that I, I left out earlier. You know, one of the risks we also see is, you know, as users type in, again, something, we'll use the example of, you know, a ballad about, you know, a sad ballad about breakups. Well, you know, all of a sudden a, sn a song snippet is created. And, you know, what if that song snippet starts cannibalizing the art created by human artists, right? If people start listening to the AI instead of the song created by the, again, the human artists. So there's, there's that risk to our clients as well. And again, as I mentioned, you know, labels have started issuing takedown requests for these unauthorized vocal deep fakes. So the industry is doing something to monitor this. But this really is one of the hot button large topics that we are seeing in our industry right now. And so I think in summary, it's just important to make sure we know, you know, AI and generative AI are here to stay some form or fashion. You know, the artist needs to have a solid team in place, label attorney, manager, business manager, to protect them from being exploited. And, you know, again, artists should also think through how they can use it for them. And, you know, the role of business manager and Armanino in this is obviously when artists are compensated for the usage of their voice or name, image, and likeness, you know, we as a business manager need to be there to make sure we are accounting for the payments for the use, again, of the voice, name, image, and likeness. There's a big role for the business manager in this space as well. So with that, I want to transition to our next topic, which is this concept of the super hand. And again, a term we've all probably heard, but a new term, uh, a new term, sorry, but a term that's been used recently uh, a lot in the industry. I think I read one article that mentioned something about, you know, the music industry is falling all over itself to prove it's all about the super fans or something along those lines. And, you know, that might be a little bit of a stretch, but I think it is clear that the industry has focused on these super fans. Well, let's talk about that. What is super fan? Listen, there's no Webster's Dictionary definition of this, but I think a good generalization is it's a subgroup within an artist's fan base who are willing to support and pay more for anything related to their favorite uh, their favorite artists and pay more than the average fan would. You know, I don't, perhaps stated differently, it means there's extreme brand loyalty, right? Or the economics term, they have a higher average revenue per user. So again, to someone who is not only loyal to an artist, but is going to spend and pay a ton more for whatever they're putting out. So, again, that's generally what a super fan is. So what kind of percentage of people are these super fans? Well, you know, you see different studies, but approximately 15 to 25 percent, 30 percent. I tend to think it's probably closer to the 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. population are probably described as super fan. And so, again, that's important for our industry. And, and why is it important? Well, again, not hiding the ball. We just discussed super fans spend more money. And obviously, while we want our artists to be creative, we also know this is a business and money needs to be made. So again, simply put, super fans are spending a lot of money and are helping to support our artists and support the industry. But what do these super fans buy? Well, again, I said they, they're more brand loyal, they spend. Well, they're getting multiple copies of the same albums. They're going to multiple concerts. They're buying VIP packages for these concerts. They're buying large merchandise purchases at either merch stands at concerts or online. They're joining fan clubs. Essentially, they're buying what not necessarily whatever, but almost whatever an artist is putting out. So again, just huge dollars are being spent by these super fans. So let's talk about it. You know, obviously some of the positives of this are the industry can focus its efforts on ways that the artist can see revenue and have a lifestyle through their art, right? And focus on these super fans. While we are always want our artists to be creative, it's important they make a living. This, you know, an area where we can focus and kind of concentrate efforts to get the most economic return. But you know, what are some? There are some negatives to this, and some people have perceived some, you know, pushback to this. And you know, one major one is there are intensely loyal fans out there that are not super fans, meaning they don't maybe have the spending capacity or economic wherewithal to spend like a super fan. But they may be just as loyal. And if an artist sees a super fan spike and their interest spike but fade quickly. You know, they may want to make sure they haven't alienated their loyal fan base and aren't targeting music just to super fans, because this loyal fan base may have a longer runway. And while the margins may not be as great at first, you can build on those margins and start to grow that loyal fan base. And you'll still see a large revenue stream and perhaps even a longer revenue stream over time. And again, as I mentioned, another negative is 
when people perceive this as taking away some artistic freedom or creativity of artists, you know, traditional push pull in the industry, right? Artistic freedom versus economic return. So we just want to make sure artists can maintain their creative freedom and can cater to all their fans and really do what they love doing is making great art. So, you know, I did want to mention you know, this is the concept of a super fan has gone on beyond just live touring. There have been, you know, examples of labels that have invested in AI driven super fan platforms. So again, the super fan is not just in live touring, but it's in all contexts. And you know, I think the industry as a whole realizes this is an area that is important. But, you know, again, we need to make sure artists maintain their creative freedom. And in this arena, we at Arm Nuno would love, you know, a good business manager needs you know, we're talking about the focusing on the economics here for our artists and their revenue generation. We need a good business manager on board. You need to track those merchandise sales at the concert or online. You need to make sure touring dollars are accurately accounted for. You need to make sure fan club money is accounted for, et cetera, et cetera. Point being is you need a good manager, a strong a business manager, a strong business manager to be able to recognize that and accurately collect and account for all those dollars that you we are working so hard on focusing on these super fans. You need to make sure we account for all those dollars. All right, so that leads me now into our third topic that I want to get into. So this third topic is Spotify and the lesser, I mean, also touching on the term artist-centric royalties, but really want to focus on Spotify and kind of what we're seeing with some recent updates and changes in Spotify. Well, first of all, you know, obviously Spotify, I think we can all say, you know, it's one of the players that, you know, changed the game and brought the streaming world forward in the music industry. and. This part of my presentation is going to rehash that. You know, we spent years talking about that. I think most people are familiar with that and know that about that. Rather, I want to talk a little bit about the new updates that Spotify has made to its royalty payments, some of these changes, why they were made, and kind of the reaction to them. So first, and kind of most notably, Spotify is going to require tracks to get a minimum of 1,000 listens every year to receive royalties. Also, the minimum payable track length for certain styles of noise tracks, such as white noise and sleep sounds, will be, uh, will be minimum uh, payable track lengths for those. And also, Spotify is taking efforts to cut down on fraudulent streams. And there are others, but really, these are the three I want to focus on. And it's important to note that you know Spotify's position is these updates will drive an additional billion dollars towards artists by redirecting payments that have gone either to fraudulent stream or payments that have just otherwise, you know, gone to noise content distributors or to distributors that may not distribute royalties beyond a certain amount. So, again, but these three, I really want to take some time today and focus on the 1,000 listens issue. And so, you know, in 2022, Spotify said that these payments to listens less than 1,000 have really added up to about $40 million in total. And Spotify's position is, listen, these 1,000 tracks in the aggregate are a big number, 40 million. But individually, really, there's only about 0.5% of the tracks that have 1,000 streams or less. And if you have 1,000 streams or less, it only generates about 3 million annually in revenue. You got each individual stream, it's not, or excuse me, each individual payment for 1,000 streams isn't a big number. But again, in the aggregate, it's 40 million. Spotify's position is instead of paying out this 40 million either to fraud, you know, to streams less than 1,000 bank accounts where it may sit there and may never even get distributed to the artists, let's redirect that those payments to artists who should be deserving those royalties will get paid those royalties. So obviously, sounds great in concept, sounds great in theory. There's some pushback to this. Uh, you know, obviously, you have independent artists saying, you know, you're a number on art, right? This is my art. What you know number whether it gets paid out or not you know, in theory should go in my bucket and i should get credit for it and you know yeah it's less than a thousand but it's still my art and you know the other concerns i've heard are you know you get to the we're saying 1000 streams now what if it's 2000 3000 5000 I mean, where does that number stop right and you know there's the again the stress of we don't know where that limit is going to be put so again as i mentioned earlier with the super fan concept you know this is kind of the push and pull of the music industry. We want to still be creative and have people, even small artists, have their music out there. We also want the economics to work and to be accurately reflected. So again, with all these updates, these are just, again, touching on the updates of Spotify. This streaming services and royalty collection, it's a huge area for artists, huge money drivers. And it's an area where, again, an artist needs to have a strong business manager in place to both track royalties, to perform royalty audits when the time is right, and just have a good sense 
make sure everything is registered, all songs are registered so the artist is getting paid uh, his or her royalties properly, and really just make sure everything is tracking and that the artist is protected and really getting the economic uh, return that they should from their art. All right, I also mentioned we're going to touch just briefly, you know, artist-centered royalties. Very similar concept at UMG recently just had a quote on this. Their chairman said, you know, UMG is focused on a fairer way to allocate the streaming pie among real artists by addressing fraud and other aspects that deprive artists of their just compensation. So you just want to see, you know, uh, you know, major labels also address this issue. And, you know, that is another just area that kind of shows kind of the streaming updates to the streaming world. All right, let's now turn our attention to our fourth and final uh, topic for today's uh, session, and that is live touring. Again, most of this presentation has been about what we're seeing in 2024, and we're going to talk about that with live touring. But I did want to talk a little bit first about a review of 2023 and what we saw, and because it was, quite frankly, an amazing year. So 2023, again, summary, record year for ticket revenues, just unbelievable dollars. Um, I mean, I'm sure we all have seen news coverage of Taylor Swift. We got fans outside the stadium equaling or more than inside the stadium. Beyonce shows and just the amazing number of fans that are showing up. And, to, you know, the economic impact they're having not only on their shows, but the whole city in general, bars, restaurants, you know, everything around the city. It's just been impacted by these major tours. Uh, so I that projected global revenue is $23 billion, roughly, I think, in 2023. And global ticket growth for the top 100 tours. Uh, that 23 billion was 9.17 billion and it was up 46 percent over the prior year uh, polestar uh, study that i saw i think what's also important you know a lot of us discussed coming out of the pandemic what is touring going to look like right and you know we've had a little bit of time now coming out of the pandemic and what's important to know about 2023 is that the figures are not just up over 2022 they're up over 2019. so 2023 figures again are higher than pre-pandemic 2019. Um, again, the stat I saw, the total number of tickets for the top 100 tours were up 18.4% from 2022, so 2023 over 2022. But more importantly, or as importantly, they were up 22.8% from 2019. So again, 2023, total number of tickets for the top 100 tours was up about 22.8% versus 2019. So again, this shows 2013 was a extremely healthy year, and I think a lot of the questions about how touring was going to look, you know, post pandemic, at least on the initial front here, have been positive and have been, you know, it's been a positive response to those questions. So now we can think, you know, what does 2024 look like? And, you know, there was a great variety webinar and Catherine, uh, one of the UTA talent strategy executives uh, had spoken on that and she forecast that the industry, her view is they'll be able to sustain itself moving forward. You know, half of those who frequent live music events have responded that they anticipate their own attendance will increase over the next 12 months. And that, you know, that US economy was not viewed as a threat. And it's in general that touring, attitudes towards touring are extremely positive. Uh, we have a lot of big artists on the road in 2024. And again, you can dig into the stats. It's kind of, uh, you can go down a rabbit hole of your own there, but the projections and stats for 2024 are very strong. Again, nobody has crystal ball, but it, you know, the projections from all the different studies you see show live touring, I think it's uh, I think I saw a uh, another study that uh, says that live shows are going to increase through 2027. And so, listen, everything is so far showing very positive. You know, there is, you know, some not concern, but one thought on the area to watch out for in 2024 is that really we've had every major, or sorry, beyond 2024, is we've had every major artist on the road, you know, is going out on the road. I should say every major, a large majority of major artists are going on the road through 2024. And at the end of 2024, a lot of those artists will have completed those runs. So then what does 2025 and beyond look like? Again, hopefully we'll see some new younger artists step up and fill that void, but it is something to, to monitor. So, and in this context, you know, it's very important that you have a strong business manager in place because going out on the road, you know, we think of the largest tours need accounting, which they do. I mean, there's tons of vendors to be paid, money to be collected, merchandise, but not only do the large tours need a good business manager for these issues and multi-state tax issues, such as reduced withholding, tax compliance, et cetera, you know, sometimes even the smallest bands need business managers as much or more than the larger bands because, you know, for them, every penny matters. They're on, you know, sometimes on a shoestring budget. So in this live touring world, I've, you know, just given numbers of the large touring acts, but let's not forget about some of the smaller touring acts and how much they need the assistance of Armenino and a good business manager. 
So again, those were some of the, you know, the four bigger areas, you know, we see in the music industry in 2024. Again, by no means is that all inclusive, but it is some of the areas that we see are important and that we see as exciting things for this coming year. So and uh, I'm Ed Eshelman, business manager with Armanino. I thank you for your time today for listening and joining me as we talk about these 2024 developments. Uh, and I hope to see you all uh, sometime in the future. Have a great day.